The social media age of the internet presents us with an incredible paradox in that it allows us to become totally absorbed in and addicted to our screens. And in doing so, cutting ourselves off from the wider world. And yet, the connectivity that we access through those very same screens puts us in touch with so much more of the world than ever before in human history. A little bit of everything all of the time, as Bo Burnham once sang about it. And yet, why do we want a little bit of everything all of the bloody time? What are the psychological conditions of our love of the infinite scroll? And how does this relate to the material conditions of deprivation and precarity under capitalism today? Between the empty fridge of content and the emotional void of capitalist realism. To answer this question, I am overjoyed to be joined by Dr. Marcus Gilroy Ware, author of Repeater's own deep dive into the digital dojo, filling the void, emotion, capitalism, and social media. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So first, I want to ask about you about your particular definition of social media and the framework for understanding them, which you call, quote, pleasure-oriented consumables, and as a kind of consumption first and foremost. And if we're going to take a sort of media theory understanding from some of the classics, let's say, like Marshall McLuhan, the idea that you know the medium is the message, is social media this new system that renders everything that goes through it as consumable? Does everything that is solid melt into content well i mean I, I think i've been long interested in the idea of, of content as a commodity and i think in a way for me that was one of the first clues that brought me to thinking about some of these things these platforms in a more kind of um you know political economic way i think for me the, the, the thing about social media in fact one of the keys to their success but also one of the main difficulties in trying to formulate early analyses of them has been that they're not for one thing. They don't have one definition. They don't have one purpose. There isn't one singular way of encapsulating them. So rather than sort of, you know, playing on their, according to their rules, by, by their terms, I thought, well, let's just pretend we've never seen these before for a second and think if you just suddenly stumbled across uh, Facebook or Instagram or something like that, and you knew a bit about how capitalism works, what would you say these platforms were? How would you kind of define them? And I think there's a kind of really interesting, there's something really interesting going on there. Um, most of the ways in which, you know, left-wing analysis talks about social media has been in terms of thinking about its users as laborers um, who are producing something of value. Um, maybe it's because I have a background or had originally a background in cognitive science when I started to write about these things. Um, but I immediately recognize that there's an alternative way to look at this, which isn't about making the, the user into the worker. The worker is in California sitting in an air-conditioned office um, thinking about how to get something from us. And it's that something that, you know, I guess provides this alternative. So the way I see these platforms is that what what really kind of defines them is that they take aspects of, you know, quite low lo low level aspects of what it is to be a human cognitively speaking um and they they derive some kind of value from it through producing these these kinds of tools for want of a better word right so um i mean every time you talk about human biology you always are running the risk of sounding very kind of apolitical very ahistorical um and i don't want to kind of be guilty of that but i think the thing that's interesting about these is that they take these kind of general features of 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 the human and in particular what what's called the mesolimbic system the reward system um and they place those features in a specific historical and material set of circumstances in which our impulses to be tempted towards certain things um can then be turned into a kind of surplus value in a very very efficient digitally kind of database driven way and that's essentially what social media platforms really are they might seem like they are communication that they're for information that they slot into various previous discourses around what the internet and cyberspace and the world wide web were supposed to be that they might be a form of sociality all of these things can be true as well but i think under underneath everything at least the makers of facebook so social media from facebook onwards they kind of knew that they were exploiting i think sean parker said vulnerabilities and human psychology 
you know, Mark Zuckerberg was not just a computer science major. He was a major, a double major in computer science and psychology before he dropped out of Harvard. And I think my framing of these is that, that the surplus value is being produced from, you know, Mark says what a commodity is or a use value is nature plus some kind of labor, right? So then the labor is done in California and the nature is us. And the two things come together to make a new kind of uh, value, which is, of course, a use value for advertisers um, and the rest we know. So that's kind of the way I see it. And that's what I think the platforms really are at their core. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the platforms have kind of taken over the internet exactly from this this earlier day of seeing the internet as a space. Well, one's a space, and two as a frontier kind of space. In the sense of digital homesteading, it's gone from being the user in the sense of users in terms of the the, 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 sort of the pioneer sense of you know making cyberspace into the user towards the tr traditional form or the more medicalized form that we consider to be the user in the same way we talk about drug use, for example, or addiction. Oh, yeah. I mean, to, even there is a great book um called after the internet by tiziana terranova and she talks about how we've we're now we're now moving from uh, an addict and an addict based model and what she calls it's no longer the internet it's now called the she calls it the cpc which does not stand for communist party of china of course but uh the, the corporate platform complex <laughs> very something right. very much different and that i think it's important to think about right. to shift the ideas we think about labor in this i mean what would you say to the idea that consumption itself is rendered a kind of labor because in terms of modern ways of recording or producing metrics for example in scrolling if you pause for a certain amount of time something some in some for example in some place they record that as a viewing for example i mean it's very flimsy yeah. the way they record viewing and consumption even i mean to the extent that consumption produces likes retweets and that there's, in, there's almost a kind of production going on there at least in terms of you know some workers work on other commodities which i mean for example moderators so, for example, the, the Kenyan moderators of ChatGPT and Facebook recently unionized a few months ago. How, how do you think it, it I don't want to ask you if you can expand a little bit how you think social media changes our perception of labor from the traditional, you know, the worker in California versus the consumer? Well, I mean, I think that's, that's yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think there are many different kinds of new different kinds of labor mm. in these platforms. Mm. Um, and definitely to me, the, the moderators and the awful things that they're having to do um, in various parts of the world. Colombia is another place where there's a lot of moderation happening. Um, you know, I recognize that absolutely um, as a, a form of labor that we need to take seriously and to which we can apply a whole a host of analyses. I'm not sure how useful it is for our overall kind of political economy of labor and think about what labor is to make consumption itself labor. I mean, I can see abstract in an abstract sense how that's possible. It is a form of activity, technically speaking. It is, you know, producing some kind of value, etc. Um, but I, I think that it, it, it maybe stretches the concept of labor beyond a place where it's actually kind of helping us. And, you know, maybe it's helpful to some, but it, it doesn't help me because I think what it does is it causes us to overlook um, another side of, of this, which is the mesolimbic system side of this, this kind of sense that actually there are bits of us that can be that can be exploited in other ways. We don't actually have to be laboring to be exploited. We can be just exploited like oil in the ground is pulled out of the ground. You know, things in us can be pulled out of us. And to make all of that labor just because it's human beings doing something, when that something, that activity is a very sort of, um, I don't know, a, a temptation driven, you know, we we often don't know why we do the things we do with social media. And that's the point that I try to make in the book. These are not rational processes. They're not subject to kind of various forms of um, improvement and, and, and amelioration from our side, as as would be the case with labor. We're not, there's no performance review. There's no kind of mm. um, efficiency drive. There's none of this kind of stuff. It's just like, we're there, we're bored, we're, you know, precariously employed, we're a bit depressive about the state of our life. And whipping out the phone and scrolling it without really knowing what we're looking for is a response to those conditions. Um, and a response to, you know, it's a desire to feel something else. And I don't, I don't know, I guess I don't know why that needs to be labor. Mm. 
No, I, I guess I get, I, I get what you mean, particularly in terms of the idea of like it might it risk displacing the antagonism or the the, the contradiction in the sense between labour and capital by rendering every by rendering the concept of labour too flat. Oh, it did make did make me laugh actually a little bit just thinking about it as he's talking. Spotify wrapped as the performance review for the consumptive labourer. <laughs> you were in the top zero point five percent of listeners for Cannibal Corpse this year. You know, uh, good on you. You get a star. You get sometimes the the odds even give you messages. You know, it's, it's, it does feel actually like a a data review. But of course, the, the pleasure kind of the gates that idea of an antagonism. But yeah, let's 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 go into the mesolimbic system actually, because I'm pretty interested in how you one sort of critique a sort of set of myths about dopamine. I mean, occasionally, ironically, I get um. I get, adver- I get advertisements for a place called Dopamine Land in London, and it's meant to be seen as a place of pleasure. But it, it, yeah, it, it really is um, saying the quiet part loud here. But what's interesting, I found out from 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 filling the void, is how dopamine actually is an anticipatory drug, and it's actually it doesn't need to provide you with pleasure. And I wonder how that fits in one well into your description of the metalimbic system, but also your you know, your analogy of the the empty fridge model. Uh, as opposed to offering us a bounty of new experiences online, actually just offering us the possibility of them and yet never really fully providing. Yeah, so dopamine is a tricky one to talk about um, because, um, and I have, to be, I have to speak about this in a way to make sure that my scientist friends don't wrap me on the knuckles later. It's, it's one, I can understand why, in general, the discourse out there finds it confusing. So it is, the mesolimbic system is your reward system. It's about how your body... and how you are incentivized to, to seek out things that, you know, I suppose once upon a time, our ancestors used to survive. And even with those words coming out of my mouth, I feel like I'm not an Evo psych person. I can't bear evolutionary psychology. But I also, I also think that in this case, when we're talking about these kinds of cognitive processes, and we're using these cognitive technologies that are absolutely designed to exploit us on that level, we need to understand what it is that they're trying to exploit. Um, so yeah, so dopamine is is a reward chemical. It's a, that's one of several functions that it fulfills uh, in the body. That means that it it helps to make you want to do certain things, like for example, consuming sugar that you know your brain needs to stay alive. Um, and the confusion is, in a way, I suppose that that pursuing those things that are good for you is itself something that feels good. But it's about how, it's because those things will be good for you in other ways, and they will in some cases also trigger other happy chemicals in, in the longer run. Although often in the case of social media, they don't um, because you aren't really getting the reward. You're just feeling the reward seeking kind of momentary pleasure of reward seeking, but which is itself pleasurable, but you, you never actually get the chocolate cake, right? <laughs> or, or the kind of hamburger dripping with cheese or whatever it is that's kind of, you know, passing through your timeline. Um, so there's there's sort of a bit of a, a fudge there, and I think that's a bit of a, of a of a hack in a way because they they are using these media to show you things that you are kind of meant to want that your mesolimbic system identifies as a possible reward, even though you're never actually going to get that 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 thing. It's just a, a, a image, a representation, possibly set to some kind of you know some kind of music, um, and that's it. And then it, on it goes, and you carry on scrolling, looking for the next. The next thing to give you that kind of sense of oh that might be a reward um, and the overall sense of scrolling through a series of media like that is itself of course one of the the experiences that can that can kind of trigger a, a, a reward seeking impulse in itself so it's sort of like i mean they call it the hamster wheel but um i don't know if, if this is making much sense but but the kind of circular unending process of just looking for more and more and more novelty more and more representations of things that may themselves be thought to be um, a reward in some way. That that's really what's um, what's happening. It reminds me very much of gambling addiction, to be honest, in a yeah. sense, for example of. I mean, even the aspect of betting puts, and in of course, for example, in video games, which are themselves platforms now. We you have know, the model of video games is predominantly now, well, increasingly becoming something called games as a live service and. Well, these are just child casinos. These are these are casinos for children, where you buy like you know slot machines called loot boxes, loot and boxes, even buying them gives you the. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd like to ask actually how about... this. I'm oh, sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say. I mean, mm. in terms of our how we categorize the problem, how we structure the problem, 
I think in a way looking at social media alongside gaming or aspects of the gaming world like loot boxes, uh, gambling, um, you know, junk food delivery, um, online pornography, all the different things that are provided by capitalism to cater to the same the same things in us. Um, those should be a category of businesses rather than thinking we're thinking about them as all kind of separate separate markets. I mean, there's in my book um, there are kind of unending comparisons between social media and sugar and junk food in particular because I think in a way that's the most appropriate thing that I can that I can see alongside other kind of digital forms of content. You know, it just seems to me obvious that the same reason that there are, um, I don't know, Haribo on the shelves in our shops, there are social media because they're, or actually also even the tobacco industry, there's a, there's a way in, uh, of hooking into our mesolimbic systems and making a lot of money out of that. There's your sugar, there you go. <laughs> awful things designed for children <laughs> it's it is so it's consumed primarily by luckily, yeah i mean luckily you can just crack these open it's a free lithium battery and it's still cheaper on the whole but like it is it is something considerably evil i mean in terms of the the idea of pleasure here uh, there's there's a philosophical problem here which i think is quite interesting which goes all the way back to you know aristotle and the idea of tragedy and you know why do people enjoy painful art or seeing you know sad movies or things like that and i want to ask how this is this, this aspect feeds into the phenomenon which is sometimes called doom scrolling and the idea of you know because the, the social media can show us especially we're seeing us now with these atrocities happening in gaza for example an unending sea of horrors things that people would in a, in a better world never have to see and i wonder how does this play into this phenomenon noted of if it is a accurate phenomenon of doom scrolling of being sort of glued to your phone looking at the news seeing all of the bad things is this an inverted form of that would you say or is it kind of a distant seeking for a distant pleasure which is only amplified in your need for it by the higher amounts of horrible horrible or unpleasant things well yeah i mean good question so i think there's a number of different things that are happening there in, in the kind of doom scrolling uh, pattern. I mean, I think, you know, one of them, and we see this with, with gaming also, because um, games can involve quite horrific moments of, you know, both in terms of what they depict, but also, I mean, as a sort of occasional gamer myself, you know, moments of extreme frustration, like, but you carry on doing it until you've managed to kind of finish that level or, or whatever it is, that particular challenge or quest. Why do you do that to yourself? I mean, because on some level you're escaping from something else. And I think, so what we've talked about so far is covered in my book under the sort of the things that pull you onto social media. But actually there's another even more important argument to make about the things people are actually escaping from. So I think one thing you can say is that there's an escapism going on. Um, the realities of your own, and I speak in general terms here, um, of one's own boring, possibly precariously un undeployed kind of bo boring dystopian life um, to use Mark Fisher's phrase um, maybe you know actually learning about kind of horrific things that are happening around the world may those things may be kind of incomparably worse but at least they're somewhere else thinking about them means not having to think about where you are, are at that moment so I think that that's one aspect of it um, on another level, there is also the kind of, I talk about this in the book too, there's a sense of kind of emotional arousal in general. So you don't have to be feeling pleasure or reward seeking all the time. Um, the fact that you are just heightened, even if, you know, if you get into like a online argument with a kind of Trump supporter or something like that, um, you know, as uh, we all at some stage probably have argued with a Brexiter or whoever, um someone we disagree with i don't know um and it's like there's this sort of really intense kind of emotional hold that it, it has on you even if it's a thoroughly unpleasant experience at that particular moment and there's a sort of way in which you can't let go you can't just forget about it um you have to go back you close it and you think okay i'm done with this and then five minutes later you go back to see if the guys responded or whatever so i think that's um there's there's an aspect of that as well and then to bring the kind of dopamine uh, side of this back in as well there's also research that suggests that novelty new stimuli in themselves are part of what will 
trigger a, a slight kind of dopamine hit. So things you have not seen before are more interesting than than things you have seen before. Um, and we can maybe talk about this in a, in a bit because actually this is one of the most important shifts that's happened in terms of timeline media, I think, um, is that they've realized the importance of that. Um, so actually just scrolling through m almost mindlessly through content you've not seen before is enough to keep a kind of low level cycle of, you know, of timeline media consumption going. Yeah, I think the introduction of novelty and particularly with the refinement of algorithms too, you know, you've seen this, you might like this. And then, mm. I mean, there's even a, a term for it, you know, algorithm core of actually some pretty, pretty great songs you find on, on YouTube. But I just want to, I mean, I just want to highlight as well that the, the emotional grip i mean yesterday it was a great example um at the time of recording henry kissinger has been dead for one and a bit days i remember waking up seeing it and i'm like i'm just scrolling all the time because i'm like oh this is going to be a good day there's going to be some amazing posts here oh fantastic and he, there's that emotional grip of you it substitutes in some sense, activity because you feel like you're in a space where things are happening. History is being because of because Trump can tweet and then suddenly everyone has to look at it. This 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 shift of almost blurring, for example, particularly on Twitter between the real life efficacy of words and their online efficacy has in a way completely collapsed. And particularly through this novelty of you know what's he going? If you I mean there's a there's a phrase that Adam Curtis used on a interview a few months ago which was you know uh, there was american host tim heidecker asked him what do people feel feel like in britain this was time when list trust was sort of imploding everything and uh curtis said something along the lines of, well everyone's very worried and they're quite scared but they're also dreadfully entertained by it all <laughs> i can't help but feel yeah, like that's yeah. there's some accuracy there to that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's almost like a kind of nihilistic response of just like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to watch the train, uh, the train crash from my sofa or, you know, from wherever. Um, that, that's, I think, another layer as well, in addition to the things that, that I said. I mean, what other response can you have? You know, maybe that's a response to powerlessness, I think. Like, well, we can't do anything about this because we're, we seem incapable of coming together as a society to do anything about that. And we're unable to do anything on an individual level. And that combination means that, you know, and maybe in, in addition, the kind of loss of faith that, that accompanies that inability for the society to come together to do anything about it means that, well, you think, okay, fine, I'll open my Haribo and scroll my phone and just watch, see what the onion has to say about Henry Kissinger's death or something similar. Yeah, okay, that's describing many an afternoon for me, I must say. And that's, it's a, but it, I actually wanted to move on to that idea of not only just negative solidarity, but particularly the void, the titular void of filling the void. Because it's not presented as what traditionally when people put this, this void is in the history of example of philosophy with an existential void, you know, built into the to human nature, but rather it's something that's exploited by real human historical and material conditions. So I'd ask particularly about this void and where it comes from, how it's constructed by our material conditions. And also, I did pick up on a use of one, one of uh, Mark Fisher's terms, which is, which is depressive hedonia, which I think is a, a very interesting way of complementing, for example, the empty fridge. Because, you know, what, mm -hmm. why do you desire to open the empty fridge? Because you can't desire anything else. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, I had been preparing to write about this stuff for a while um, in the more in the context of analyzing the media that are on social media themselves um, and try to explain to journalists why social media is not an information space um, and but not quite sure what the argument exactly what the argument needed to be and then when I read capitalist realism um, and got the concept of depressive hedonia it just really was very useful because it suddenly gave me a term for many things that I've been sort of thinking about and feeling and trying to kind of formulate, but I didn't have an exact way of putting it. And then Mark's work just kind of gave me that. And then I was like, okay, now there's really a much more interesting project here. And then, and then I went on a whole journey to kind of try to unpack that a bit more. Um, and, you know, I think you're right. There is, again, we're dealing with, with multi-layered things here. There is this kind of long-term existential, you know, almost abject aspect of, of human life you're born knowing that you're going to die right so i mean i don't think that that's absent from the things that i'm talking about but i do think that 
you know, without wishing to kind of indulge in, you know, the narcissism of the present, I think there are aspects of our moment, things that that Mark tried to write about in sort of, you know, 2009, 2008 with the K-Punk blog that 10, 10 years later, 15 years later, we're kind of seeing how they, they, they move on a bit. Um, but there are aspects of this kind of very kind of hyper consumptive, but, you know, politically extremely hopeless kind of that combination. I don't think that that is uh, trans historical. I think that's quite specific, but it's a, you know, it's a particular moment in, in our media, in our culture, in our politics that we don't know how to respond to. And I mean, even I, you know, I left university undergraduate in 2005. I left university thinking I had a future, you know? And I think, I mean, I teach undergrads now and the kind of levels of, um, in some cases, you know, existential dread they have about the future and what place they are gonna have in that and how it's gonna work or what their agency is, you know, I've only the, the greatest of empathy and solidarity with them over that, because I think that that's, that's a much newer problem in a way. And so, you know, there is a historically specific and a, a long term general aspect of this and the ways that capitalism has changed and developed and the things that it's done to us and done to our planet. Um, you know, I am often sometimes, you know, when you're in an intellectual discussion, and you're kind of in a hurry, you used to use the word capitalism, and then you get accused of being kind of, oh, well, capitalism is 400 years old, you know, what, why are you throwing that word around? And um, um, I did a thing for the BBC once where they told me not to use the word at all, which is very typical in a way. Um, but I think, you know, if that's, if that, I, I, I sort of acknowledge that critique, but I think at the same time, we do have to have Maybe that happens because we don't have some like better, more specific ways of talking about this precise moment in time. I mean, Erdrich Jameson makes the point, I think, in the introduction of uh, post uh, postmodernism, that we only later realize the specificities of a of a historical moment that we're trying to write about. It's very hard to completely conceptualize and and frame something from within the moment that you're actually writing about it in. Um, and so perhaps it's too soon, you know, but there, there has to be ways of, of talking about that kind of, I mean, in 2017, 2018, people started using the phrase late capitalism again, which I thought was interesting, because obviously that, that term goes back to the 1940s, whatever you call it, there's a kind of a really um, disturbing and unsettling and, and dystopian nature that, that life has kind of t- taken on, I think, in, in some regions, at least. I mean, as a some something of a zoomer, uh, yeah, the, the humour of my generation is predominantly it's it's not so much capitalist realist that they, we can't imagine an alternative so much as that we can imagine an alternative and we we see it being uh, held back or constantly defeated, you know. So, but it's the the predominant feeling is you know uh, it's going to be barbarism, isn't it? In response to Rosen Luxemburg's question of socialism or barbarism, and I think the humour very much reflects this, and particularly in this nihilistic consumption of content, and actually. Even for the generations that are following us, one of the, we talked about this before we start recording, is in lieu of this void, it doesn't say, into, one of the things that is increasingly being thrown into this void, or rather being offered as a filling to the void by the very forces which historically, you know, produce reaction and produce these, not new, but they're new, they're, they're, diff- they're, they're different, but they're also new in the same way. And they've also always been the same, which is a new modulation of, of late capitalist. I wish I could, I'm saying late optimistically here, uh, misery, which is new rise of you know, forms of online reactionary culture. And oh. you mentioned you're doing some ethnography work on particularly the, the influence of TikTok and spreading reactionary ideologies, particularly um, that former Big Brother contestant, Andrew Tate, who apparently has a new career. Um, <laughs> hmm. Yes, I mean, I'm very troubled by, and I've spent the last four years um, studying very various aspects of the of social media's ability to spread reactionary ideas and to and to think critically about why it is that that seems to be such a kind of match made in heaven or match made in hell, really. Um, you know, and obviously there's lots of kind of rather fluffy discourse out there about oh well, you know lies are halfway around the world while the truth is getting its boots on kind of, you know, of course, social media, uh, you know, it, it's a very sort of simplistic stuff, but um, I think it's, that's all not necessarily untrue. 
Um, but I think, again, it's, it's to the sort of origins of these platforms as corporations and what their own priorities are and maybe even some of the other patterns that we've been talking about as far as their recklessness and their ability to exploit things about us that we can look to understand maybe why reactionary politics and social media seem to go so well together. Um, and it's mostly for the same reason that misinformation and social media seem to go so well together. Social media platforms don't care about what is actually on the platform. They only care about how they look. They take action um, to remove things when it's making their PR uh, people's job more difficult, but they don't actually care about the harms that these things have. And in some cases, it's worse than that because, of course, there are people in Silicon Valley. I mean, Elon Musk, of course, being the most... Um, high profile example who hold quite reactionary views and whose position um, enables them to be sa safe from m many of the kind of harms that those politics actually represent. Um, and which means that the, the sort of any features that might be built into these uh, technologies that, that might limit that are kind of not considered at all or are added later. Um, but you know, I'm not really. I don't want to be technocentric. I don't think there are very many features that would that would help that much. I think it's more the case that if you build these things to begin with, knowing the state of the world, if you're honest with yourself, then you you, you must know that these that that's going to happen. There is going to be hate speech. There is going to be misogyny. There is going to be um, a large number of people who might actually be persuaded by those things because they wouldn't otherwise have been exposed to them. You know, and in the case of TikTok, which obviously isn't doesn't have this quite the same Californian prom uh, provenance as, as the other platforms, um, it has one of the youngest audiences of, of any social media uh, platform. Um, you know, the the kind of when you think about that, and you think about the kind of general lack of controls built into it, and the fact that it has a young audience, what it means is I can access through, uh, at least discursively, I can have access to the discourse, to the to the conversations and the cultures of young, of very young people. And I can, I can reach them in ways that conventional media doesn't allow me, you know, to, to do. And I mean, it, this, this is not meant to sound like a sort of, please think of the children kind of argument, although those are um, in, in, interesting in themselves. But I think, you know, people, whether they're children, whether they're older members of society, you know, who actually are more likely to pass on certain forms of um, of misinformation as well if, for other reasons. Um, if it's people who are not kind of equipped with what they need to be sort of protected in, in one way or another from very uh, simplistic and accessible forms of political ideation that sound very tempting or play to a certain sense of political frustration or angst or disenfranchisement or whatever, then those kinds of, of things are going to snowball and they're going to do so very quickly on digital platforms because there's nothing there's nothing holding them back they they just lubricate and quickly you know allow the conversation just to kind of run away so i think um i don't think i don't know if that quite answers your question but i think that's where we kind of have to to start with with these things and tate is just you know a particularly malign and, and nasty example of that no, I think in terms of the the actual structure of how they built them, I think you're completely right. I mean, another thing I've been studying as well recently from uh, Cory Doctorow's latest book, oh. you know, The Internet Con, it's one of the way, because you know, his famous concept of inchitification, where essentially if you're on a social media platform now and you're to any extent sort of invested in it, you are a captive audience to some extent. Uh, and this is because he, he describes it because of lack of interoperability, which is essentially leads to high switching costs and what that means for, for everyone listening is basically that you can't take your tweets with you when you leave twitter you can't take your followers your audience you can't you can't take it with you when you go um and if you're invested in the communities and the relationships and the posts you make you know your fav or even you know, on facebook your family photos your memories you can't take them with you and so that's why a lot of people end up staying on these platforms even though they make them miserable and why they hate them because they can't leave and the way it's kind of built into i mean you know the task is to kind of make things interoperable make things that you can switch in between platforms but that, that you have in order to do that you have to tackle the very basis of intellectual property and therefore property <laughs> it almost seems to cascade further and further down into these ideas 
ideas of, of enclosure mostly. Yes. I mean, I think in the case of interoperability and, and the issues that you, you point to there, you know, why is any entirely profit driven business who, at least in the States, is only going to be accountable to their shareholders and nobody else um, going to spend my, money and time implementing features that enable them to be competed with more easily? If anything, they would prefer to do the exact opposite, which is to make it, you know, much easier for someone to bring their tweets to their platform, but but not to get them out, you know. Um, all these platforms have an import or, you know, they, they, they would be incentivized to have an import functionality, but they don't have export because they don't want to, you, you know, it's the competition aspect of it that I think uh, is important there. As far as enclosure, I mean, I think that speaks to a much broader point about like public conversation, you know, conversations about what's happening in the world as well as conversations about what's happening in our own lives are meant to be a, you know, ephemeral, social, political thing that comes and goes. You know, you don't have to be a massive Habermasian to know that there's a sort of important public role that these things uh, have and that these things become locked into these platforms is, I think, undeniably a way of, in if you look at the history of enclosure, I mean, there are some things that don't quite fit, but actually it, it's a very apt metaphor, I think, for talking about how these processes, which are old processes between humans within their societies, now exist within this kind of digital fence and cannot be taken out of that. I mean, I don't want to call it a space, but they can't be taken somewhere else. They're completely fixed. I mean, and, and all of this, of course, taking place according to a a very rapacious profit-driven set of logics. Um, so it's, it's, enclosure, it's enclosure all day long. In fact, in my first book, I said, oh, I'm using enclosure as a kind of loose metaphor. And in my second book, I sort of came back to that and said, no, I'm basically not using it as a metaphor at all. I'm saying this is actually enclosure. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's a little bit strong, but you know, that's more or less, I think I, think I would stand by that. <laughs> No, I, I would stand with you on that. It is absolutely an enclosure. There are, I mean, there are certain aspects, admittedly, that don't match on in the same way. I mean, you know, that have you, have you seen this, the, the field of digital real estate, where it was a big thing when VR was going to take off and then it famously didn't, despite the, the billions meta spent on it. And that never took yeah, off because it, it was too worked. ephemeral. But if we think about these, them in the same way that, for example, uh, people, you know, not just as abstract property, but as arable land a space of where you can generate data and therefore sell it on as metrics you know i mean it's, it's hard not to think sometimes that data is something of a hot new commodity for capitalism in the sort of way that debts became very sort of like central to the, the, the for this financial speculative very emerging online economy to all the way up to 2008 that data is the kind of thing which people sell because that's the thing people invest in you know the metrics the map being the territory but this this enclosure of everything to make it a site of data production i think is very uh, even actually i think feeds into what you're talking about earlier which is the existential fear of death because one of the things i've been researching recently was okay what is it that people get so attached to about their data and then i looked into digital wills the idea that you can write a, you know for your for your so-called digital remains and i was looking at the site for digital memory foundation i think it's called and they say okay this is your digital will here's a template this is not binding on anyone because your data is owned by the companies, not you. And it, it, to treat remains as private property of someone else is a very interesting, emotional, effective intertwining of the enclosure of even the ways in which, I mean, our, our data on these social media platforms isn't just content to us to some extent. It's also a, an element of our self-consciousness. It's our, it's our objective spirit, to use a sort of Hegelian term in some sense. It's, a, it's, mm. our, it's our means of recognition. And it, it's interesting how the, 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 the enclosure of that also in, entails the enclosure of self-consciousness, what someone like, what's his name, Peter Hershock once called the colonization of consciousness by television, but on a way more intensified scale. Yes. I mean, I think I think that's absolutely the case. I would agree with everything you say there. I think the only thing is that we have to sort of ask, you know, we have to ask why that data um, is valuable. And I think mm. if if data are deemed just to have an objective value for themselves, we sort of run, mm. we run aground a little bit. Um, I think data mm. are a commodity, um, but I also think that they are 
uh, secondary commodity and that we need to look at the primary commodity as well, which is attention. Um, you know, sometimes I think about it like, and maybe my chemistry here is a little rusty, but if you are refining iron ore to produce steel, you need a secondary thing, which I think confusingly is called coke. It's some kind of carbon product and it gets combined into the process. And then you end up with, with steel, right? And I think data for us is that secondary commodity that helps you produce the primary commodity, which is attention. And I think if you use an attention um, and reward model for your primary commodity, then suddenly you have a reason why you remember and the sort of cycle of, of, of capitalist, you know, production and consumption is plugged back together again and works because of course, attention, <laughs> attention um, drives more consumption in a way that data by itself, you know, my pictures on my Instagram, subjectively, are, are valuable to me and my the people I, I choose to allow me to follow, you know, on, on Instagram. And I, I post very occasionally, or hasten to add, I'm not a big Instagrammer, but um, in case anyone wants to kind of gotcha that, oh, you write about these things and you still use the platforms. Yes, I still use them. And I don't write, you know, write about them from above as if I'm somehow better than everyone else. But anyway, um, these things are valuable subjectively to you and I, but I don't pretend for a second that Facebook or whoever Meta actually care about the contents for their own sake. We can't imagine that, right? So then why are these things valuable? There must be some other reason why collectively as a, as a bank of data, they're valuable in other than just being an accumulation of what you or I like or happen to have, have communicated on that particular day. And the reason is because that enables that you know, that overall shift um, that these platforms do so well um, to a highly, highly personalized experience of what you actually see, some of which is of your choosing, which is called, you know, um, self-selected personalization, and some of it is of the platform's choosing, which is pre-selected personalization. And I think that kind of, for me, helps make it make a lot more sense because it's, it's your attention to those things as you are filling the void, as you are distracting yourself from your day, as you are looking for whatever it is, sociality, connections with your friends, perhaps even some factual information, God forbid, um, you know, you're also being shown other things that may lead you to make new purchases within an overall capitalist economy. And um, if you were to believe those logics, that's the thing that justifies all of the rest. And if that connection isn't made, then it's just a sort of line rather than a circle. Problem is, of course, that as Tim Huang has written, um, those advertisement logics don't necessarily actually make the whole thing make sense because there's a lot of obscurity in that machine. There's a lot more money being spent on ads potentially than actually lead to sales in the end. And if the whole thing is justified by, by an advertising model that doesn't actually make financial sense in the long run or is it's only a matter of time until advertisers realize that that's not going to work anymore, then potentially the whole internet as we know it is built on a kind of subprime model, which is what Huang argues. And I think that that's a very kind of interesting and rather scary uh, analysis, but it, I find it persuasive. That's a really good way of putting it because it, because even the people spending money on ads now are spending money on ads based on the ways that these platforms are themselves ads for themselves for advertisers. And it is essentially going to be on you know, trumped up metrics, particularly, I mean, for example, the way that Netflix counts a view it's barely more than a minute, might even be less than a minute. It is genuinely, um, not to go too liable, you know, but it's generally not necessarily uh, what m people would regularly think of as considering watching a whole episode of The Crown or something. And I also think, yeah, I think it's, it's you know, I think it's very important you brought up the, the aspects of attention as well to render data or something secondary because with, with attention, it's 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 almost like a biological brute fact of literal physical motion and neural. In a sense, you know, neural energy, neural uh, intensification towards uh, and or fixation towards anything on the screen. And it's interesting in that sense. It's almost like a, it's like an inversion of the problematic of cybernetics, which was, you know, how we've already got power, 
we've already got the we've already got the generation of heat how do we build a thermostat how's the system communicate with itself we've got the communication system we've got the platforms how do we get people to power these things to push content through the scrolls so that we can put ads in between them not mm. not to get too matrixy here but it is kind of feel like sort of maximizing our output is maximizing our physical and neural investment through the attention economy there so i just want to know that's a really good way of putting it yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like when you or I, should we post something, um, you know, online, we're actually posting, what we're really doing is adding an additional incentive for someone else to then engage with our content plus any advertising that exists around it. And the data that attaches one to the other, that's the, that's the valuable data, right? Not just in terms of follows and likes and so forth. Do you ever have the thing where you follow someone you don't know and for a day or two, your feed is just filled with their content because they oh oh, you know he he's followed them so that must be that must be something really important. They they still they still seem to be kind of figuring this out in ways that often seem hopelessly wrong actually. But that nonetheless, there is that connection between you know what we think we're using these things for, what we think we're we're posting or viewing, and what the actual underlying logic really is, which is the the attention one. So since since for, since filling the void and indeed after the fact came out, we had this what I described as like a great leap forward in terms of the leap into the online with the advent of of the, of the pandemic. Not even not only simply in the, the sense of people working from home and having more time away from the office to to scroll and the like, but also the ways in which platforms, not necessarily ones we describe as, as social media, but platforms generally have taken more of an advance into the world of work with more people becoming Deliveroo drivers, Uber drivers, of course, forced into this by precarious working conditions and th the higher amounts of ordering themselves. I mean, look, looking back on sort of your work on digital media and digital culture and the social relationships within it since since then how, how how much do you think things have really intensified i mean how mad has it gotten since since the great leap online <laughs> a lot a lot madder but i don't really know with what unit to measure that in a way i think um i can see an intensification i think we can all see that i, I worry about where that will lead i wonder if there is you know there has been said to be from time to time a backlash against these things, but I, I don't really see it. Um, you know, I think in the case of social media, you can identify a very, very interesting shift, um, which is that they've realized, you know, going back to what we were saying before, that the kind of socially driven model is essentially quite limited because there's only, you only know so many people. And let's say you follow everyone that you, that you know, most people that's about 150 people right and then you're getting a kind of stream of content based on that that's limited if you think about the value of novelty as we were saying earlier that's also limited at a certain point for the for the platforms to carry on growing and responding to our increased demand and our increased screen time and all the rest of it they had to change tack a little bit and i think that social media have become much more focused on entertainment um in terms of what they what we are expected to think they are giving us and what the subjective experience is. And they're much more focused on entertainment specifically from people who we do not know. In other words, the For You page of TikTok, which is primarily derived from people you don't follow and, da and data-driven, it's pre-selected personalization based on, on that data, um, seems to be the new model now. And you know, YouTube and Instagram have followed suit on that the search page, the kind of scrolling of shorts and, and reels. Now it isn't the people you follow anymore. It's people the algorithm thinks you could, in theory, want to follow. And that's a far, far greater amount of content, um, which means that, of course, the ceiling is removed and the amount of attention that we can give them is now far greater. Um, so that, I think that's a clear shift and that's a clear break with the model that I offer in Filling the Void. Um, which is one reason why I'm planning to write more about that model and, and how it has updated. Um, more broadly, I think as far as, you know, the other platforms are concerned, Deliveroo, you know, the kind of so-called so gig economy. I mean, I think it's very likely if we think about the role of technology in, in labor and in capitalist labor, um, that that will just only continue to increase, you know, um, 
the bar to entry is already very low if you want to be a delivery driver with a push bike um, or a learner, you know, a learner badge on a moped. Um, and our cities are full of people doing that kind of work. Often they are amongst the poorest people in our societies who have, t- have taken on that kind of work because they felt they had no option. I, I have a hard time believing that most people would would enjoy doing that. Um, and I think that, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I can only see more intensification of those kinds of things to come, more uses of, of algorithms to kind of not only observe and monitor and control those forms of labor, but to um, simultaneously exploit it and undermine it to the point where, you know, obviously Uber is widely known to be uh, training self-driving cars on its human drivers. Um, and of course, there's lots of other forms of technology that are built into that apparatus to to monitor and control those drivers as well. So, yeah, I'm afraid I, unless, I mean, there's some, there's been some great work by, um, you know, investigative journalists and smaller trade unions to try to push back against some of that. Um, but I think the problem remains a serious one um, in terms of what the future of labor looks like. And actually, you know, Another thing I suppose you could say is that as far as if we want to talk about AI um, and or, or you know, the, the role of more and more sort of intelligent algorithms and coming into uh, a greater and greater span of, of different kinds of labor, that with generative AI, we see a kind of even bigger proliferation of that. Who is it that who, whose work can be devalued and, and replaced and de-skilled and, and undermined by an algorithm that can that can do the same thing or something that most people can't distinguish um, for far less cost. I think the number of people on that list, the number of professions on that list um, is frankly growing, you know, with every year. Um, of course, I don't think that generative AI is actually there yet to replace, you know, composers and painters and all of those kinds of things in a in an erudite sense. So if you really care about those things, if you're really into those art forms, you can spot the difference. But as far as the artwork on your hotel room that's been produced previously would have been produced, you know, uh, on the wall of a hotel room, it's been produced by like a more precarious artist whose name isn't widely known. That's, I'm afraid to say, not looking good. So um, yeah, platforms and labor and attention, I'm, I'm sure that there will only be more kind of merging of these systems as as this kind of logic you know proliferates itself just to to highlight something for any for any comrades listening right now who are in any of these uh precarious gig economy apps uh if you're in based in britain the independent workers of great britain are a fantastic union for this when uh when other when other when other bigger unions aren't trying to sweet uh, sweetheart deal deliveroo not mentioning any names gmb but Oh well, uh, but also the no, rebel room as well. I wanted to just... get in touch with your yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, I I, I just totally agree. I was going to shout out that the IWGB actually, I think they've done some amazing work <laughs> on in these areas. Um, so yeah. Yeah, big up, big outside OGB. United Voices of the work, United Voices of the world as well. If people are based in sort of East London sort of way, but yeah, in terms of the the shifting labour landscape, I mean, even with AI, I mean, um. I, I tend to use Jeff Bezos's term for AI, which is artificial artificial intelligence, um, because yeah. he when his because when he describes the Mechanical Turk, his his which is his system, it's like it, yeah. it does all the work that AI does, but it's it's collections of micro. I mean, for me, I'm fascinated by micro work, uh, the thing that Phil Jones describes in his book Work About the Worker, which is an amazing book uh, if everyone hasn't hasn't read it about these new systems where you do these tiny pennies on the dollar, sometimes pounds tasks, like answering surveys, reviewing Facebook advertisements based on how much you want to see them, um, training data sets, moderating data sets, and how these actually produce AI. I mean, JetGPT's moderators for one thing, but also since the, also there's also a hard limit to AI itself, which is for a lot of them, they have to cut off the, um, I mean, they've literally given themselves a firm planetary sort of deadline which is they don't really add anything into the data set before 2021 or at least if they're anything else they're very careful with it because well it's the same reason you don't feed cows other cows uh you mm. feed because it, it, if it can't distinguish between things that are made by ai made by ai and not made by ai and indeed maybe the moderators can't as well 
you get a feedback loop. It enters into a kind of some sort of cybernetic bovine spongiform encephalopathy. You know, it's a, it gets it gets a kind of mad cow disease, and it's it is interesting. It's from this conversation talking about we're actually seeing, for all despair, there are some hard limits to this. I mean, only in the sense of you know the, the interest rates are now no longer zero in the US, so the money isn't infinitely free from groups like SoftBank or you know anything like that. But even with with Musk's unhinged ranting at some economic forum a couple of days ago about how advertisers are killing the company, it seems like the social industries are hitting a, a firm limit here. I mean, for example, Meta, uh, Meta with uh, the investment, well, Facebook slash Meta of the investment, all that VR office stuff, which no one is going to buy. Um, Bankman Fried selling, you know, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair on crypto, and that crashed. Musk mm-hmm. could become, you know becoming unhinged well more of an unhinged fascist fascist and then throwing every advertiser out and i mean anyone else who going is jeff bezos because he only because he has amazon web services you know who, who's the biggest guy in the gold rush the man who sells the shovels i mean it okay. kind of seems like do, do you think this is accurate in some sense that we're hitting a hard limit of these these social industries and is that is that a space for hope or are they going to take us down with them <laughs> i mean i i think people are smarter than you know, consumers are, are given credit for being. And uh, so that does give me hope. And I think, you know, I, I see these in a very kind of dialectic way. I, I do think that there is a, a, you know, there are a number of things we haven't spoken about yet today that that are quite positive, even amongst all of this. Um, you know, like, for example, we talk about social media misinformation, but we don't talk about the Im- the many amazing content creators who are making really engaging and accessible and accurate informational content in all sorts of interesting areas that you can learn about and you know that's all free at the point of you know the moment you're actually watching it um so i i think there are things that give me hope and i think the kind of discernment about like most people can tell that elon musk is kind of a dick you know um but there are areas where I don't think there are as many limits or the limits are not as clearly um, obvious to people yet, right? I mean, actually, mm. it was one of the things like, one of the reasons I keep coming back to social media is is that, you know, we are still really using it a lot. You know, Instagram is a very successful mm. product and in the kind of overall attention economy. Um, you know, people do buy Teslas, people do use Amazon, you know, there are places in which the kind of scale, mm. you know, or think about Apple, I mean, the, the, in terms of its, its capitalization, it's the amount of investment that it's had, and so forth, it, it's sort of, there are places where that it was all hype, and we figure out that it was all hype, you know, and I think, I don't know whether generative AI is going to turn out to have all been hype, people, some people I know in Silicon Valley are saying, it is basically hype. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, sorry, slightly losing my train of thought there. Um, same with, I suppose, same with with the VR offices thing. You could kind of look at that and see that that's not really. Um, I don't know. That was hype. That was never going to. Do we yeah. really sit and think? Oh yeah, I really want that. <laughs> I really want to be in VR with my coworkers. I love my coworkers. I love running into them in the hallway. I love being <laughs> on campus where I teach. But I do not want to be in VR. At at work i just don't and like teams is bad enough why would you want to make that into a headset you know um and i'm sure that most people just instinctively feel that too like you know um Mm. so i think there are some of these limits are just kind of these people sitting in california dreaming up ideas about what they think we ought to want or what our bosses ought to want um are a bit unhinged how anyone could be investing in vr and thinking that one singular task where you just focus on that and you're in a headset and you know if your friends text you you can't see that if um push mm-hmm. notifications come through you can't see that you're just doing one thing completely doesn't understand the very attention economy that is probably in the case of meta at least paid for them to be in that position to begin with they ought to know that the vr headset without push notifications to interrupt what you're doing is never going to sell it's mm-hmm. never going to go beyond a certain limit so i think there's a kind of in fact, Meredith Broussard writes really well about this, this kind of long-term history of the technologists who develop these things have mm. no idea really what it is they're doing half the time and frequently make mistakes that either lead to horrendous unforeseen con- you know, consequences 
or I guess in some cases they're just they're just a flop. And as far as Teslas are concerned, you know, I think the whole like electric car kind of battery element of these kinds of new technologies, um, in as, insofar as we're expected to see them as green and, and all the rest of it, um, that's mm. I would say coupled with the overall digital economy that, that also includes companies like Meta. Um, you know, I mean, there's some, a lot of really good work now being done on the, the global political economy of lithium, for example, um, showing mm. how extremely damaging and problematic that is. Same with cobalt, tantalum, all of these other things. I mean, it may even seem obvious to point them out, but actually there are hard limits, materially speaking, as well, which, mm. at least in the case of batteries, we're already, you know, coming up against in the case of, of tantalum and cobalt. And it will soon it will be plastics, you know, and other things as well. I mean, so um, there are there are limits, but there are also reasons for hope. I guess it's a very long answer, but mm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as, as Deleuze said, there is no need to either fear or hope. We must only seek new weapons. But and we're coming up to the hour now, Marcus. We before we, roll, uh, before we uh, roll things up, uh, what are you are you working on anything right now? What can we expect from you in the future? Well, um, so I, I uh, yes, at the moment I'm working on a number of smaller projects. Um, maybe they'll find their way into book form at some point. Um, some of them are on those reasons for hope that I was talking about. I'm very interested in having been writing about information and reactionary politics for so long. Um, mm. Sorry, misinformation and reactionary politics. I also kind of want to speak about some of the forms of creativity and information making and seeking that I see online. Um, at the same time, I'm also currently working with a, a colleague to, as we mentioned earlier, to do this kind of study mm. of um the, the newest generation of reactionary masculinity content, um, you know, epitomized by Andrew Tate. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I think it's very important uh, to stand up as a sort of, you know, relatively kind of normative straight man and stand up and, and loudly say for all these reasons why mm. I hate that, why I disagree with it, and why the discourse mm. around manhood and boyhood should not be claimed or characterized only by by those things so um mm. so that's coming up soon and working on that at the moment um and yeah you know i suppose there will be other things as well that i mean probably are too early to talk about but yeah so there's a mi mixture of focusing on the really horrible stuff and on some of the the, the reasons for hope as well Tarek, i know you watch these New edition. <laughs> please, please. No, but Marcus, always well, thank you so much for joining us over on the Al Nasser Horizon you. on Zero and Repeater Books. Um, and uh, everyone, thanks for listening. We'll, we'll catch you next time. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the web. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.